Good morning, PCI. It's Pastor Colby here in our sanctuary. Um, I'm missing you, but I just want to thank you for tuning in to our sermons as we continue to stream these, walking through our sermon series. I also want to thank you for your flexibility. Um, it's just kind of an uncertain time, and it's really the heart's desire of the leadership of PCI to be safe, responsible, and wise. And so we prayerfully considered and thought it was uh, best just to take this time uh, to regroup. Um, we can stream services online. We'll be connecting with you throughout the week uh, via phone. Um, but just want to thank you for being flexible with us. If you have a Bible or if you don't have one, grab one. What we're going to do is we're going to look at Luke 22 verses 1 through 6 and verses 47 through 53. We're going to continue our sermon series titled Lead Me to the Cross. Um, and for those that aren't aware or haven't joined us, uh, this is our third installment of the sermon series. What we're doing is we're looking at the Jesus's last couple days on earth. And so we start off the sermon series looking at the Lord's Supper. Uh, not only the theological significance that Jesus uh, instituted the Lord's Supper during the Passover, but the practical implications it has for followers of Jesus Christ. Last week we looked at uh, the prayer of Gethsemane, where Jesus uh, just kind of completely became undone um, in recognition of what was about to take place at the cross, that he would drink the cup of wrath for our sake, that while in the garden Jesus would be pressed um, by the will of the Father, and, and the pressing of Jesus would actually produce our salvation that he would soon accomplish on the cross. So the point of this series is to continue to have our eye on Easter morning, and what Jesus accomplishes on the cross, and looking at these last couple nights, um, and the significance and the practical implications for you and I as, as we follow Jesus in this season. So turn with me to Luke chapter 22. We're going to read verses 1 through 6, pick up again at verses 47 through 53. So follow along with me as I read. Now the festival of unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching. And the chief priests and teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. And flip with me to uh, verse 47. This is speaking of Jesus. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was happening, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come with, for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness remains. Would you join me in prayer? Father, I thank you uh, for your love. Your love that uh, sent Jesus down to this earth to live the perfect life, to die the death that we all deserve to die because of our sin. And I thank you, God, that even in these last remaining hours of Jesus' life, that he continues to reveal the glory of the gospel. And I pray, God, that even today as as we're uh, at home or, or watching this from a distance, God, that, that you would speak through your word, that your word would have authority and, and would convict our hearts and, and that you may pull us into a deeper relationship with you. And so, God, be with us in this time. We give you the glory and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A great need we have uh, to understand and trust is that our Lord is always in complete control of every situation. My question to you is, do you believe this, that God is in complete control of everything? 
You know, it, it's kind of an easy question, or, or maybe I would say it's a hard question to ask as, as kind of the, the whole globe is in turmoil and, and kind of confusion and chaos with coronavirus. But do you believe God is control of that? And do you believe God is in control even of the situations that come across in our own lives? I think so often when we are pressed by our circumstances, we react in fear and unbelief. We kind of go back to our fleshly nature um, rather than living out uh, a faith in who Jesus is and, and what his promises are. We worry, we get anxious, because way deep down, we think the future depends on us. Way down, we think we're in charge, and that if things were going to get better, I'm going to have to act in order to make it better. And the best way to handle trials, brothers and sisters, is to remember God is sovereign and is in control, and we are not. And this text is rich with this theological truth. What I'd like us to see today is the power and control God has even in the midst of a dark trial. Jesus is fully aware of everything that's about to happen. Jesus is fully in charge of the situation. And actually, Jesus is allowing them and letting them arrest him in this time. And my prayer is today that when we run into events in our lives that, that cause us uh, to move towards anxiety and fear, that we will remember this passage, that nobody takes Jesus' life, but he is laying it down freely for his people. And so turn with me to Luke 22, verse 1. To set the scene, the city of Jerusalem uh, would have had a lot of excitement and festivity. As we talked about before, this was the Passover time, which meant that pilgrims from all over had flooded the city and made it uh, swell to several times its normal population. Typically, Jerusalem uh, in this time would have had about 30,000 residents living inside of it. But now at Passover time, uh, with all these people flooding into the city, it would have grown to perhaps several hundred thousand people there. So you could just kind of imagine the clutter of people. You could imagine the sense of joy and, and the sense of excitement uh, for this festival and, um, and all that's taking place. And yet, behind this joy, behind this, these festivities and excitement, there's this confrontation that's been building up and is now at its boiling point. The confrontation is between Jesus and the Jerusalem authorities. It first begun uh, with a series of sharp disagreements and discussions with a lot of dialogue. But it escalated dramatically, and now they're, they're in a complete falling out. Um, on the Jerusalem leader's side, they have ceased any kind of dialogue with Jesus, and now we're told they're just intent on killing him in verses 1 and 2. And Jesus, on his part, has stopped teaching in the temple where he's been almost daily since coming into the city for the Passover feast. Um, and now we're told that the leaders want to kill him, but they can't do that right now. They can't do that out in the open. Now, part of that is because Jesus has become particularly popular, uh, especially in the north region of Galilee, whereas he's been doing so many of his miracles. So that the rulers know that if they try and arrest Jesus out in the open in public, it'll provoke this crowd of thousands of people, uh, particularly the Galilean pilgrims, who are now in time for the feast. So they come to conclude to do this right, they need to find some way, kind of, kind of on the sly, kind of a stealth way, to ascertain where Jesus is, to arrest him and put him to death. And so in their hatred for Jesus, they are intent on finding some way to do this. Now while this is going on, Luke shares with us that something else is going on behind the scenes. And what's going on uh, is in the heart of one of Jesus' followers named Judas. Look with me at verse 3. And then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. Uh, we're told here that a couple things that are significant for a couple reasons. The first is Luke, in kind of this painfully obvious way, wants us and the readers of his gospel to understand the gravity of what's taking place. By the way, he describes Judas as being one of the twelve. This is a term commonly used throughout the gospel of Luke, a term describing a few men who were handpicked by Jesus 
to follow him for these uh, three, a little over three years. And these men would have seen and experienced Jesus' authority in so many different ways. They would have seen and heard Jesus' authoritative teachings. Now think of the Sermon on the Mount. Think of uh, the thousands of people and kind of the radical message Jesus was preaching. Uh, think about Jesus' parable, parables and teachings of the kingdom of God. Um, just all these teachings that reveal um, what his purpose is, what this gospel is about, and the radical implications for those who follow Jesus. And the disciples certainly would have heard his teachings. They would have certainly heard or, or seen his authoritative, or rather his authority over creation. They no doubt would have seen um, all the debilitating wounds being healed. Think of the woman who bled for 12 years. Uh, think, of, uh, think of all the healings that Jesus did. Think of all the dead people that Jesus rose from the dead. Think of all the demons that were cast out. Uh, uh, think of Jesus calming the storm on the Sea of Galilee. These disciples not only would have heard his teachings, they would have seen his authority at work. But more than that, they would have experienced his authority at work through their lives. We're told throughout the Gospel of Luke that on numerous occasions, Jesus would send out his disciples and give them authority to preach this gospel message and to exercise his authority over these situations. So much so that the disciples would have come back and marvel how, how people were healed, how the dead were raised, how demons were cast out, all because of this radical message of the gospel. And yet, Satan entered into one of the twelve. My question is, how could someone with so much firsthand knowledge of Jesus fall so hard? And the answer lies in verses 4 and 5. We read that Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. Notice, Jesus or Judas approached them first. Verse 5, they were delighted and agreed to give him money. And so the answer lies in kind of these two reasons. The reason Judas fell, even though he had all this knowledge, he had seen the teachings, he had, he had seen Jesus' authority, he had experienced himself, he fell. Why? For two reasons. The first reason is Judas had a loose view of sin. He had a loose view of sin. What do I mean by that? Well, we're, we read in verse 5 that they gave Judas money in order to betray him. In fact, I think it, it's got Mark's gospel that says Judas actually asks how much money they'll give him if he gives him information to betray Jesus. This is actually not the first time Judas runs in uh, to money. We're told in John that Judas was actually uh, in charge of the money bag of the disciples. He was the treasurer of the group. But John reveals in John 12, verse 6, that Judas uh, would help himself to the money that was put in it. Judas had this sin of greed that he, he had this loose view of. He would never confess it, and he would never repent of it. And the truth is, brothers and sisters, that unconfessed sin will always open the door to Satan's power. Unconfessed sin always opens the door to Satan's power, and that was one of the ways that Satan was able to enter into Judas's heart to lead him and guide him to betray Jesus. That's the first point. The second point um, is that Judas lacked submission to Jesus. What I mean by that is Judas, I'm sure, supported the ministry of Jesus. I'm sure Judas was all for the the humanitarian side of it. Yeah, people should be helped. Uh, the poor should be reached out to and loved. Uh, the people oppressed by sickness or the demons, uh, they need help as well. But, but Judas had his own standard of power and success. And Jesus fell short of that. Said another way, Jesus disappointed Judas. Therefore, Judas would not submit to Jesus. He had expected a different kind of Messiah. Uh, Jesus was not the kind of Savior he was really looking for. 
Judas was looking for a Messiah who would carry out a general sword, who would, who would vanquish the enemies of Israel, who would restore David's kingdom uh, or throne. Judas, and, and because uh, Jesus was the Lord outside of Judas, Judas's standard of power and authority, Judas chose compromise. Judas chose independence. Judas chose to lean on another standard of power and influence. And that's the second point. The first point is Judas had a loose view of sin, and it gave the devil a foothold to get in. But the second, probably more, more uh, uh, drastic implication for us is Judas supported his ministry, but he never submitted to his ministry. Uh, Judas had his own definitions of what power and authority are, and, and Jesus just was not cutting it for Judas. And so Judas went to the, to the chiefs, uh, chief priests and scribes and agreed to betray Jesus, uh, we're told in Matthew's Gospel, for 30 pieces of silver. Now, 30 pieces of silver may or may not seem like a lot of money, but by today's standards, it was about the equivalent of a half year's wage. So, minimum wage, New York right now is $11.80. You work 40 hours a week for 28 weeks, half a year. It comes out to a grand total of $13,200. $13,000 is what Judas betrayed the Messiah for. He had a loose view of sin. And he lacked submission to the authority of Jesus. And so Judas goes to this group. And then notice, verses 7 through 46, that a lot happens between Judas's initial betrayal and Judas bringing the betrayal to fruition. Judas actually goes to the Last Supper and celebrates it with Jesus and his disciples. And then we're told in verse 47 that as Jesus, uh, mind you now, dinner took place and finished uh, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane and prayed, and kind of in the midst of Jesus talking to Peter, James, and John to stay awake and, and pray that they may not themselves enter into temptation, that while he was still speaking, a crowd came up, we're told in verse 47, and a man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. Judas led this crowd to come and betray Jesus. I think growing up for me, um, I, I pictured this crowd being uh, maybe like a dozen or two dozen soldiers. But John's Gospel really reveals that, that there is a certain gravity to this. John's Gospel tells us that a band of men and officers of the chief priests and Pharisees came. Now, a band of men is actually a specific term. It, it denotes Roman soldiers were part of it. Now, remember, Jerusalem at this time, at the time of Jesus, was occupied uh, by Pilate and Herod and the Roman government. And so what they had just north of the temple within Jerusalem was the Tower of Antonia. Oh, to, the Tower of Antonia was this, this complex that overlooked the temple. And within this complex was a courtyard of between 300 and 600 Roman soldiers. And their point of being there was to prevent any kind of, any kind of insurrection or any kind of riot that might take place to dethrone or, or push up against the Roman government. And so Judas and his craft is able to get, we don't know, maybe 300 to 600 Roman soldiers to join him in this quest. But John also reveals that there are officers of chief priests and Pharisees. Now these would have been the Levites of the day. Within Jerusalem in the temple gates is the courtyard uh, where these Levitical, almost police officers would reign. Now their job uh, was to execute and enforce judgment made by the leaders of that time. And we're told in Judas's waywardness, in, in his, his lack of uh, a view of the reality of sin, and, and his lack of submitting to Jesus as his Lord and Savior, he was able to kind of gather together hundreds of soldiers, both Roman and Jewish, to come and get Jesus. And we're told in verse 47, he approached Jesus to kiss him. 
he approached Jesus to kiss him. Now, this is interesting. In my mind, it would have been very easy for Judas to come up and say, it's that guy right there. Uh, it's that one right in the middle. Go get him. But that's not what, taking, that's not what happens. Uh, something else is going on. To kiss is actually the same word we translate as to love. It, it's one of the Greek words that denote uh, a sense of um, brotherhood love, a, a sense of warmth. Um, and thus we kind of see the mocking horror of this gesture. The image of betrayal is, it, it right here, is one of the most powerful ever to grip the human imagination. Out of this false facade of love was truly a kiss from hell. Um, and so Judas comes up and he kisses Jesus. Now, practically, we know why is um, Judas was revealing to the officers who it was that was leading this riot. Um, so practically, uh, it was to let the crowd know who to arrest. But symbolically, there's something else. Symbolically, Judas solidifies that, hey, he supported Jesus, but he did not submit to him. And my question is, how many people confess Christ? How many people profess Christ, but hardly anything in their lives indicate a real commitment to him? What I mean by that is they symbolically kiss Jesus externally. They, they want the image of being a follower, and they want to look a certain way, but they never embrace him internally. The preacher J. Vernon McGee was fond of saying, I believe in the assurance of the believer, and I believe in the non-assurance of the make-believer. And how many of us, uh, if we really question ourselves, how many of us are make-believers of the Christian faith? We, we delight in, in looking like a Christian and acting like a Christian and talking like a Christian. And like Judas, we may believe that, uh, or, or like Judas, we may desire that Jesus is this authoritative person that will exercise power um, over the governing authorities. And yet, we never internally come to submit to it, who he actually is how he actually rules, what his standards for power and authority are. The truth is that like Judas, uh, we are tempted to betray Jesus in these ways. Um, it's something we're all capable of doing, and, and we probably do it more than we probably even realize. And yet, and yet, in the context of this betrayal, Jesus does the most remarkable thing. He engages Judas. Look with me at verse 48. Jesus asks him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And kind of at first glance, it appears like Jesus is trying to understand the situation. Uh, are you, is, this, is this what you're doing? Why are you doing this? But we know, kind of looking deeper, that Jesus asks this question with another intent. After Judas does this, Jesus' response is not a front. How dare you? How dare you betray me in these ways? How dare you do this? Jesus doesn't do that. Rather, his response is to immediately assume the posture of a surgeon of the human soul and begin to speak words to Judas that are designated to make Judas realize his own wickedness and the terrible danger of what he's doing. And in a way, it's, it's his final plea for Judas to repent and turn back to God. In fact, Jesus has done, reached out to Judas and pled with him to repent and turn back to God, not one time, not two times, but three times throughout the Gospels. And not once did Judas even hint at responding. It's one last chance to see how far the sin of love and of money had taken him. And though he was Satan's agent, Judas was a lost soul. But the glory of the text is, Jesus cares about lost souls. And in this moment is actually Judas on trial. Even though there's hundreds of soldiers standing around, armed for battle, Jesus was calm, cool, and collected. And he was engaging this lost soul. 
And as this is going on, we're told in verse 49 that the disciples who were there, uh, they, they begin to kind of wake up to the situation at hand. We're told in verse 49, uh, they asked, Lord, should we strike with, with our swords? Now, um, this is kind of more of a rhetorical question. I don't believe they were genuinely wanting Jesus' response, uh, mostly because then we're told one of the disciples grabs his sword and begins swinging. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we misunderstand God's will. Sometimes we ignore God's will. And when we don't understand it or we choose to look away, we begin operating in the flesh. And that's exactly what this disciple, who, who I believe it's the Gospel of John, says it's Peter. The disciple Peter begins wielding the sword, responding in the flesh, not responding to the Spirit. And Peter begins wielding the sword. Now, I don't believe Peter was trying to cut off this guy's ear. I believe Peter was going for the head. Peter's a fisherman. He's not a soldier. And so, in kind of this interaction, uh, Peter ends up catching this, un Luke doesn't even name him, begin catching the servant's ear, his right ear. And in the flesh, it reveals that all of us, when we misunderstand God's will or we choose not to seek God's will, uh, just like Peter, we choose to respond with the wrong weapon. We choose to, to respond to the wrong enemy when we're operating according to the flesh and not according to the Spirit. And in one of the greatest ironies in all of Scripture is that the last recorded miracle of Jesus before he goes to the cross is that Jesus repaired the sin of a misguided disciple. Jesus says in verse 51, no more of this. And at once, his response, I, I want to think about this in two ways, uh, his control and authority and mercy clearly seen here. At once, his response, um, and, and, and I really want you to see this and think about this, the important thing that Jesus understand, understood at this point is not to go on the offensive and attack, but rather what Jesus was pushing for um, which is significant for us, is to accept the providence of the will of the Father in this moment. Jesus chose to do the will of the Father, and Jesus was revealing to the disciples, all the gospel accounts say that Jesus uh, did not want them to respond in violence, rather he submitted to the will of the Father. The second thing I want to point out is to see the authoritative love in Jesus' heart. Jesus not only spoke, but did deeds of love and mercy all the way to the end. Is that not the picture of the gospel and good news for sinners? There may be some of us listening today, um, and you may be listening and thinking to yourself, because of the sins in your life, that you are beyond the love and mercy of Christ. But I want you to look at this text and look at Jesus' final words to Judas his final words to Judas are words of love and mercy. And his final acts towards the unnamed servant is an act of love and mercy. And the truth is that no one, no one is outside or is beyond the love and mercy of Jesus Christ. And so amid the blood and ringing sword, Jesus calls out, no more of this. And in that, all the action is frozen. And Jesus has the floor. And we're told in verses 54 through, or, or 52 and 53 that Jesus begins rebuking the mob for treating him like a common criminal. He says, am I, a, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. In other words, if Jesus was a lawbreaker and guilty of some crime, then they could have arrested him at any point, but they didn't. This shows that their claims are unfounded. They are saying that Jesus is guilty of insurrection, and if this were the case, why didn't they arrest him at any other occasion when he was walking through the city unarmed? It takes this, this cluster of hundreds of soldiers, 
of the chief priests and, and, and servants and elders and Pharisees to make the arrest that they could have made at any point of any day. And yet they chose this time. And it kind of reveals that, that this arrest is unjustified and a sham from a human perspective. But at the same time, something divine is happening. Something supernatural is in the making. And Jesus goes on to explain why this is happening now and did not take place before. This is your hour of brief success, he says. This is a moment Jesus has actually been waiting for. This is what he'd been praying for, that a, a very short few hours of evil will be permitted to have success. However, the plan of God was coming to pass exactly as he had planned. The evil schemes of man were carrying out the plan of God. Jesus allowed them to arrest him because that was his plan. And so what he's saying is, this is your hour. This is your dark hour. And my father is allowing this because my father has a greater purpose for this. Jesus in this moment is rebuking the crowd because Jesus is looking beyond the trial. He's looking beyond the darkness because he knows his father has a plan. And he remains in complete control. Brothers and sisters, always remember that evil will only have short success when it accomplishes God's plan. What I mean by that is God regulates and limits evil according to his purposes. Therefore, when we enter into trials, they will only last as long as God decrees them to last. He is the one in charge, so we do not need to uh, have fear about the future because that is in God's hands. And he is good, and he loves us, and he's working things out uh, to those who love him and are called according to his purposes, Paul says in Romans. And so Jesus endured the hour of evil success so that we can experience the benefit of salvation that he was accomplishing. Never lose sight of the fact that Jesus is king and that Jesus alone controls the universe. And in this moment, there was silence all around in the night. And this was a necessary prelude to Jesus' victory. That there's devouring darkness, and yet Jesus is the victor. And when we trust him as our personal victor, then we become a part of his victory. And a Savior who triumphs in the darkest hour can deliver his children from theirs. That we can be sure that when our world spins out of control, he is with us. We can be sure that the apparent evil we suffer will work out for good, for our good, and for his glory. And so the two questions I want to end you with this morning is have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Uh, because if you haven't, um, I want to implore you in this time, come to Jesus. Wrestle with this question personally uh, to grasp the words of Christ and everything he accomplished. And I want to invite you to ask Jesus into your heart to receive his gospel, to receive his victory for your life. Have you asked him? And the second question I want to ask is will you trust him through this chaotic time? Will you continue to trust him, knowing that he is in complete control and he is sovereign and nothing that's taking place is outside of his providence and purpose for your good and his glory? I want to end with a story. Uh, many of us may recognize the name John Wesley. John Wesley was one of the founders of the Methodist Church and, and the Methodist movement in England. Um, but what many of us don't know is that John Wesley was saved, he was converted, he was born again as an adult after having already served as a missionary um, in Georgia in the 1700s, um, after already serving in ministry. And so uh, this one particular occasion while traveling from England to Georgia, um, Wesley's ship encountered this huge, terrible storm. And, uh, and, and Wesley actually thought to himself that he was going to die. And so during the storm, he noticed, uh, as he's contemplating this for himself, he noticed 
there's a Moravian Christian named August Spangenberg. And the two men begin talking about the difference in the confident faith of Spangenberg in facing death and the fear of Wesley. Spangenberg asked John Wesley a question that he described as embarrassing. Spangenberg said to Wesley, Mr. Wesley, do you know Jesus Christ? And Wesley responded, Sir, I know Jesus to be the Savior of the world. Spangenberg then asked Wesley a question that would change John's life forever. He said, True, but do you know that he has saved you? The difference is between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus personally. Judas knew that Jesus gave sight to the blind. Judas helped the disciples distribute a miraculous meal to over 5,000 people uh, of food that Jesus provided. Judas saw Jesus walk on the water and command the wind and the waves to submit to his authority. Judas knew that Jesus claimed to be the Savior of the world, but Jesus was not his personal Savior. And so the text question before us today as we go forward is, is not to, uh, is don't make the same mistake in your own life. Because conversion, brothers and sisters, is not like a flu shot. Oh, I did that. Oh, I got that. Conversion, rather, is have you, uh, have you, are you continuing to repent? Are you continuing to believe in Jesus? Are you continuing to chase after and love Jesus on a daily basis? That is the difference. Because as we'll see next week, two disciples really betrayed Jesus in this time. Judas, and next week we're going to look at Peter. But there's one qualitative difference between the two. Peter gets restored because he repents. Judas never comes back around. Uh, he always remains having this loose view of sin and lacking a submission to Jesus. Will you join me in prayer? Father, I thank you for the gospel power and authority. I thank you, God, uh, for the gospel revealed in this text, that even in the midst of chaos and sin and, and personal um, understanding of power that is not of you, that, Jesus, you remain faithful and good and merciful. I thank you, Jesus, that even all the way to the end, you were uh, beckoning Judas to repent of his sin and, and to come to you. I thank you, Jesus, that, that you healed the servant's ear, revealing your own heart, that, that you continue to step in with your merciful love. And God, I pray that this merciful love would be felt um, by, by the people of this church in this season. I pray, God, that, that you would calm our hearts with your powerful presence, that as stuff continues to um, unfold with coronavirus, that you would convict our hearts that that you are a God who's sovereign and control over everything, and that we need not fear this season, but we can trust you and trust that you have a plan for it. And Father, I also want to pray for those of us in our congregation who are just personally going through a hard time. I pray that even in the midst of their trials, that they would trust you. Whether it's cancer, uh, whether it's upcoming surgeries, um, whether it's mental illness, God, I pray that uh, you would send Jesus to shine in these dark seasons and that you would enable us to trust and seek you in those times. God, I pray that you would um, continue to provide for us um, with every need we have. I pray, God, that as we continue to go step by step closer to Easter, that we continue to wrestle with, the, with your gospel revealed to us in Luke. And I thank you for this text this morning. I want to give you the glory and thank you again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, I want to thank you for joining us, joining me this morning. Uh, just a couple quick things before I end. Uh, one of the leaders of this church is going to be reaching out to you this week via phone. Uh, we just want to remain connected with you um, to make sure you're, you're being loved on and prayed over. Um, and so be expecting that. The second thing is um, we do want to encourage throughout the season to continue to support the life of the church that you love. Uh, we exist to do this ministry maybe in a little bit of a creative season right now, but we do that by your generosity and support. 
And so we just want to encourage you to remain faithful in your pledge and your tithing. Um, and you can actually do it by going to our um, website, pcislip.org. Click on the Donate button. Um, and, and if you're having trouble with that, please call the church office and we'll kind of walk you through the process. If you're more comfortable dropping off your donation or pledge, you can do so during the week um, for our church office. We'll remain open during its regular hours. Um, but I look forward to connecting with you this week. Um, join us as we continue to pray throughout this season. Pray for your leaders of this church and let us continue to seek the glory of Jesus in this time. Have a great week.